what we work on at Metabolon is really the small molecule world. And so instead of looking at the uh, genes or the RNA or the proteins, we're really focused on the small molecules. And just to set the frame on that, we don't find evidence for more than about 2,400 small molecules in, in humans. Uh, and what we do is we can measure these in a biological sample. We do it through mass spectrometry, and I won't go into a lot of detail about that. Uh, basically, what we're doing is we're taking a sample, run it through uh, mass spec, and what happens is you produce a, a huge amount of data when you do that. So if we just run water through these systems, we'll produce about 40,000 data points, and that's just noise. Okay, if we run a biological system, uh, matrix through it, we'll create about 42 or 43,000 data points. And so what we've had to do over the years is really develop software that would go in, uh, separate the signal from the noise, and, and then be able to identify compounds in that uh, complex signal, uh, be able to organize that data and report it out and quantitate them. And so what we're after in the end is really understanding every molecule in the sample, uh, in blood, uh, for example, and then being able to uh, understand what we see in a disease state. And we've run over 4,000 uh, studies now, and we've been able to really build a, a vast ontology uh, on, on uh, metabolism, and on, on metabolomics. So if you take uh, the four platforms that we were talking about in mass spec, and then you look at the deep uh, lipid analysis that we do, what we typically are seeing about 1,300 molecules that are maintained homeostatically in, in human blood sample. So of all the people in the room, you're all maintaining about 1,300 of these small molecules in your blood. Uh, and among those are gonna be molecules derived from the microbiome. And so we know these molecules are from bacteria and, and the microbiome for several reasons. One is that humans don't have the metabolic uh, systems to be able to do do this. We don't have the enzymes to make these compounds in our genome. Uh, and if you do uh, extended antibiotic treatment of humans, most of these are greatly depressed, if not completely gone out of your blood. Uh, and in xenobiotic uh, experiments with, with rodents, for example, these molecules aren't there. So uh, they're very important for a number of diseases. As you've, as you've heard, the relationships between the microbiome uh, in a lot of disease states are being set now. Uh, and what I can tell you is in, in a lot of childhood uh, developmental disorders, a lot of that is happening at the level of these small molecules. And it makes a lot of sense for that because uh, you know, your, a lot of your neurotransmitters and things like that are made, uh, are coming from this uh, bacterial uh, microbiome as well. Uh, so this is just looking at the uh, advancement of the technology over the years. Uh, it, we started on this in about 2002. Uh, we've undergone many, many version uh, improvements, engineering projects, software development projects. And what you see in the, uh, the inset on the uh, lower left is the uh, improvement of the data quality over the years. And so where we started out with an average process variation of about 48% uh, when you averaged out all the molecules, and on the, the other end set, you're looking at uh, the number of molecules we were seeing. So it went from 50 to where now with accurate mass instruments in our software, we're up to about over 1,000 molecules on the mass spec platforms at a uh, average process variation of less than 5%. And so that's better than what you typically see in a clinical laboratory. And in fact, our, our uh, platforms are now under CLIA. Uh, and so we can move this, we have moved this into the clinic. Um, and so what we're doing is essentially this is our map of metabolism that we've uh, curated over the years. And so we're going through all of this metabolism and what we're doing is, is really in a blood sample just figuring out what, what is actually happening in a pathway and how that relates to a disease. So that's how we do it. And I can't go into a lot of detail because of the time, but now I'm going to show you kind of how we've been using this, especially clinically. And this, this uh, particular story started uh, a couple of years ago in uh, some work we did uh, with Helmholtz Institute and King's College in London. And the idea was could we map allylic variation in humans back to metabolism in the blood? And so we took two cohorts. One of them had about 1,800 individuals and one about 1,000. They had what was at the time saturation SNP analysis on them. There was about 455,000 overlapping SNPs. Uh, and we needed a bond, uh, an association. We measured all the blood metabolites and ran the ratios of those metabolites looking for a product reactant uh, relationship. 
and we needed to be above a Bonferroni in both data sets to qualify as a hit. And so we, we got about 37 gene associations. And to me, that was reasonably uh, surprising that we got any because we didn't really have a lot of individuals. And so what we're scoring here are allelic variants that are very uh, frequent in a population and that actually have a big effect on, on the organism. So if they don't, then we wouldn't see them in that kind of a, uh, the small data set. But there were 500 associations that really didn't reach that uh, criteria. Uh, and so we upped the numbers to about 9,000, and re we reported uh, this summer in Nature Genetics that we've upped the number of associations now to about 145. So with 8,000 individuals, we've got about 145 of the uh, functions of those genes now being mapped onto, onto metabolism. And we've upped the number uh, of hits that didn't get above the Bonferroni correction to 2,000. And when you start mining those, there's actually some uh, very uh, good hit. Uh, th they are probably a lot of findings in that 2,000. And so basically what we're trying to do now is up that number. And we have a goal and that we're working towards that. Part of that is with HLI and, and Craig Venter's uh, group. Uh, but to get to about 500,000 because what we believe right now is that we can really map the ontology of most of the genome onto, onto metabolism with this type of an approach. So the genes are involved in changing things that change metabolism, and as we see the allelic differences uh, and we start mapping these, we can start establishing how the genes are working in networks to control metabolism. Uh, so, so I'll change gears a bit and talk a uh, talk a little bit about work we've done uh, in inborn errors of metabolism. This was a project that was initiated by Art Baudet, who was the char uh, chair of uh, Baylor College of Medicine's genetics department. And Art's issue is that he is the referral from the state of Texas screening lab for inborn errors. So if you get a hit on an inborn error uh, measurement on a baby, it gets referred to Art's department and they have to diagnose the patient. So they can't let the patient out without having either a positive diagnosis or being able to show that the patient um, doesn't have it or what disease the patient has. Uh, and in doing that, it can take them uh, actually two things. One is a lot of testing because they'll have to run five or 10 panels per patient on average to get a diagnosis. And they'll have to use a lot of blood samples. So in, with an infant, that's a hard thing to do. So, Art proposed a study to us and said he was going to send us um, 200 patients and they'd send blood and urine. It's going to be completely blinded. And he wanted, to, and there'd be cases and controls in the group, and he wanted us to call who was a control, who was a patient, and what disease did the patient have. And so we did that, and the summary of the results is we called all 70 unaffected patients as uh, unaffected. Uh, we called 129 of the diseases correctly. And the one we missed was actually a disease case that was being effectively treated by an intervention. And so the, the molecules and the metabolism weren't out of control. And when you look at what those diseases are, this is kind of a summary of that. Uh, this is uh, in, in review right now in, in a journal. And uh, of the 200, there were four that had three MCC, uh, and we called all those correctly and didn't call anyone else with 3MCC. So you could go down the whole list and you had 100% uh, sensitivity and specificity on those diseases. Now, the way we did it is through a mathematical treatment of the pathway data. And so what we could do is take an individual uh, and look at all the molecules in a pathway and score those molecules in terms of standard deviations away from the mean of the population. And so if they were greater than one and a half standard deviations from the mean, we'd give them a value and that value would increase uh, the, the, the larger away from the mean it got. Uh, and then we'd start summing those pathways. And then we could sum the sub-pathways into larger pathways and finally into super-pathways. And what you're looking at here is a patient. Uh, and this patient is scoring high on nucleotide biosynthesis. And that's shown on, on the uh, left panel. And when you look at the right panel, it's every sub-pathway leading into nucleotide pathways been affected. And when we look at other pathways, which is on the, right, the left over there, none of the other pathways in, in, that we were looking at were being affected by uh, this, this particular problem. And when you look at the actual molecules involved, uh, the only thing that could actually um, 
you could actually explain that as a mutation in thymidine phosphorylase. And so this, this could lead to a very quick score of that disease. So then this particular patient did have a thymidine phosphorylase mutation. Now that was a little complicated, so we developed a different tool. And what this is, is taking that biochemical pathway map, and now we're gonna project those results on in a kind of visual way onto that pathway map. And so what you're looking at here is a patient, and we've given a circle and a color. And so if it's red, it's, uh, it's going up, you know, the, the value is up over the, uh, the mean of the population. If it's blue, it's down. Uh, the size, you start with a colored dot at one and a half standard deviations away from the mean, uh, and that increases until we cap it at five standard deviations away from the mean. And what you can see in this, with about a thousand molecules being measured, you can see across the map the, the average kind of a, a background noise because we're, we're starting at one and a half standard deviations away from the mean, and so there's gonna be a lot of hits. Uh, but where your eye goes to is that upper corner, and when you pull that up, that's branched chain amino acid catabolism. And so that's the catabolism of phthalene, uh, leucine, and isoleucine. And what you're seeing is a bunch of molecules in both pathways accumulating to, a, a, and then there's a certain break point, and then everything below that is decreasing. And so the enzyme that actually causes all of those three steps is an enzyme called branch chain amino, uh, keto acid dehydrogenase. And a mutation in that enzyme is the inborn error called maple syrup urine disease. And so you can score, we can now score about 45 of these diseases uh, because we've seen enough patients. And we can, you can imagine with a result like this, you can write an algorithm. You know, so if we write that algorithm and say, okay, if a patient ever looks like this, we can pull, pull them out very quickly. And, and that's what we're doing now. So we can effectively score about 45 inborn errors. And we're gonna probably increase that about to 200. And we can do this on a single draw of blood, looking at about 200 microliters of plasma. And so, you know, this is gonna be very useful for, for the inborn error field. Uh, and we're doing this actually clinically at Baylor right now, so they ship us samples on a weekly basis. Uh, so in doing that, we were working with Tom Kasky, and Tom's on our board, uh, and he had a, a group of patients he'll probably talk about later called the YPO cohort. And uh, Tom had done exome sequencing on these patients, and he gave us the patients blinded and said, okay, go see what you can see in these patients, and, and let's, let's see what happens. And, so this is one of the patients, and we're looking at a patient number 3905. Uh, in this particular case, uh, you're looking, we, what we saw were sorbitol and fructose, and this would, uh, accumulation relative to the population, and this would be a disease called, um, this would indicate fructose intolerance. And uh, fructose intolerance is caused by a mutation in the aldolase B, B gene. Uh, and in the sequencing results, that wasn't being resulted, that wasn't being uh, sent back as a probable or a, a deleterious mutation. Uh, but when the gene was inspected, it had a mutation in aldolase B. And so this is a case where there was a mutation not being thought to be dangerous, but actually it's causing uh, fructose intolerance. We had another case that's here, and this is xanthine dehydrogenase, where the patient carried a deleterious effect, uh, what was being called a deleterious mutation, and xanthine dehydrogenase, which will lead to xanthinuria, but in fact, the patient didn't really have xanthinuria. And so this is, again, a case of gene penetrance that we were confirming at the metabol uh, metabolome area. And this particular case is a, two cases of patients that were seen that had a Tylenol toxicity. And so in this case, they're, uh, acquiring, or they're accumulating both very high levels of Tylenol metabolites one of them is showing liver disease already, and the other one is seeming to be healthy. The one that's showing liver disease has depleted glutathione, which is glutathione is the protectant of, of Tylenol toxicity. The other patient's almost the highest in the entire cohort of glutathione, which explains why he wasn't seeing liver toxicity. So about 20% of the cases we had a medical finding on that we, we had inspected. So, We've actually moved this and we're moving it now into concierge medicine. Uh, we can actually take a blood sample now, report out about 20 different chronic diseases uh, just looking at these blood samples and looking at what's happening. And so 
but we're enlisting about 10, uh, 10 to 25 concierge clinics this year, and uh, we're trying to actually now work on how to report this information to a doc so that in the prep time, uh, the physician is able to, to, um, to relate the condition back to the patient and be able to tell them how to, um, how to respond.